So you are no longer a slave, but a child. In the name of God with us, creator Christ and spirit, amen. amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. And Merry Christmas to each of you. The feast continues. You know, I can't come to church on the first Sunday after Christmas without recalling this same Sunday in 2011. I was then serving at Trinity Church in Copley Square. I was overseeing all the worship services in that great gilded barn of a church in the heart of Boston. I'd asked the rector, the late Sam Lloyd, if he wanted fresh flowers and greens for this day. I'm a little afraid that some of the poinsettias will be looking a little crumply and tired. Sam beamed at me and said, that's okay, Patrick, so will we. <laughs> well, maybe your poinsettias are looking a little crumply and tired. What cookies remain may be stale. I noticed at Costco on Friday morning a long line to return gifts at the customer service desk. But freshen up, friends, because this morning the feast continues. What the church has handed us to read and to sing this morning, the first Sunday of Christmas and the last day of the passing year, is brimming with good news. And perhaps a surprise or two for the crumply, the tired, and the carbo-loaded. So you are no longer a slave, but a child, says Paul to the church this morning. This is because of the singular event of Christ's birth. When the fullness of time had come, Paul writes, God sent his son, born of a woman. Easy to miss, perhaps, almost a passing reference in the cascading clauses of the voluble Paul. But he's telling the Christmas story to the church in Galatia. Perhaps he's stating the obvious to the church. Perhaps they all know this already. But the intriguing thing is that Paul is writing to them before any of the Gospels themselves were written. It's intriguing to wonder what they all knew and assumed about this birth. Had they heard of the Bethlehem stable of the shepherds and the magi? who will be recorded later in the Gospels of Luke and Matthew. The world may never know. What we do know through Paul this morning, though, is the essential. That this birth has transformed all births. That this child has made all of us children. The good news is that God wants to be with us always in a new way. Freshen up, friends. And through the metaphor of slave and child, Paul is contrasting the norms of the dominant culture where relationships were economic and transactional. Slavery, I feel like a number. He's contrasting that with a new life in community as God's gathered people, where relationships are to be characterized by mutual love and regard for the other as sacred siblings. Paul's Christmas story starts with a child, but widens its focus instantly to all of us. No longer a slave, but a child, he said. We are not here to put each other to use, either good use or abusive use. We are here as siblings with a common parent. A few words, but their implications are astounding and earth-shattering. They are the best possible news. Love comes down at Christmas, and love also lifts us up. The divine becomes human and the human becomes divine. So any Christian concern for human rights, any politics claiming a foundation in Christian faith must begin here. 
with the particular understanding that the human person is sacred. Regardless of personal virtue, regardless of accomplishment, regardless of things done or left undone, the word made flesh blesses all flesh. All flesh, regardless of personal merit. Isaiah makes this point to us as well this morning. None of this is our doing, the prophet insists. As the earth brings forth its shoots, God, God causes righteousness and praise to spring up. These don't come from us. They don't start in us. Both Paul and the prophet are operating from an understanding of radical equivalency of all people in the context of God's love. Its pull on each of us is as impartial and as, as universal as gravity. That we can defy, resist, or ignore either gravity or God's love is true as well. As John tells us this morning, the world did not know him, he reminds us. But the fact of the good news, the Christmas event changes everything and for all time. You know, in that same church I spoke of just a few minutes ago, I came to know a man. This morning I'll refer to him as, as Hal. Hal was not a parishioner, but a sometimes visitor. He liked to sit in the back. He happened to be a somewhat accomplished oncologist. Hal was not a joiner per se, the sort of person who staunchly refuses to wear a name button. That was Hal. At the beginning of his retirement, Hal himself was diagnosed with a particularly lethal cancer, a cancer that would ultimately claim his life. Hal came to visit me one day and to share this news. And in my office, seated in my office, he bowed his head, not in prayer, but he was sort of looking at his own body as he sat in my visitor's chair. It's kind of shocking, but I'm surprised at how surprised I am. But my words have become flesh, he said. What he meant was that his decades of advising and care, lecturing his vast knowledge of cancer, seemed different from the inside, with cancer a kind of occupying force in his own body. Whatever else professional health care may be, it is a form of transaction. And Hal was looking both at a cancer he knew would end his life and for a healing that was not the same as a medical cure. I'll never forget his telling me that he had decided to stop treatment and enter hospice care with the support of his wife and adult children, people I did not know. There are a couple of people in my network, Patrick, who are telling me that I'm waving the white flag of surrender a bit early, he said. But aren't you the one who told me that white is the color of Easter? Maybe I'm waving an Easter banner onward onward, whatever the hell that means, he concluded in our third and final meeting. A good man, an accomplished man, a holy death, freed, not enslaved, a child of God's. So you are no longer a slave but a child. What Hal showed me was a piece that was not resignation. What Hal showed me was hope that was more than optimism. He was sure of very little, I think, and in another way, sure of everything. In this new year of life, may you know peace 
that is not resignation, hope that is more than optimism, and the love of God who knows you, not as a person of merit or demerit, but of a beloved child. In God's name we say, amen. Standing together, we affirm the ancient faith of our church in the words of the Nicene Creed. 